Well, good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to this first of this winter's uh, Hope Farm uh, webinar series. Um, I'll just go through a few quick housekeeping things um, and then we'll get on. Uh, as this is a Zoom webinar, you won't be able to turn on your video or your microphone, but you will be able to ask questions using the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. We have allocated some time for a Q&A session at the end, but if we don't get to all the questions, the remainder will be answered after the webinar and shared after the event. All the presentations that we're making this evening will be recorded. There is no chat function enabled for this, um, but if you want to ask questions, ask them in the Q&A. If you have any technical issues, we have somebody helping from the events team uh, who might be able to help, but there were some Zoom related issues, um, uh, we might not be able to offer any support. And finally, before we get on with it, I'd just like to say thanks to all the speakers and everybody else in the background who has helped produce this webinar and hopefully will have a very enjoyable and stimulating evening. So uh, on with tonight's webinar, which is titled Farming for Resilience and a Positive Environmental Footprint. Uh, we've got a range of speakers tonight. Um, uh, Professor John Storkey from Rothamsted Research, also from Rothamsted Research, uh, Dr. Sam Cook, and Georgie Bray, the Hope Farm Manager. The post-war productivity gains of UK agriculture have been accompanied by a number of negative unintended consequences for the environment, including dramatic kinds of farmland biodiversity and pollution of watercourses. At the same time, in recent years, yields have plateaued with increasing gap between the potential of new crop cultivars and the yields actually achieved in farmers' fields. This might partly be a consequence of degraded natural environment and the ecosystem services it produces, provides to agriculture, including pollination and the regulation of crop pests. The ASSIST project has attempted to quantify the potential of these services and the, their providers to improve the resilience of crop yields in the context of other constraints on productivity including things like abiotic stress, uh, particularly climate change. Uh, at Hope Farm, we've participated in the ASSIST programme. This is a programme led by Rothamsted Research and the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, looking at improving food production efficiency and remaining, uh, remaining resilient, reducing our negative environmental footprint in farming. So without further ado, I will now introduce our first speaker, Professor John Storkey. Uh, John is a, an agroecologist working at Rothamsted. He's a background in weed science, but is now responsible for a range of projects, all aiming to better integrate nature and nature-based solutions into commercial production systems. He was the Rothamsted lead on the ASSIST project, and he's going to talk to us uh, now on some thoughts on regenerative agriculture. Over to you, John. Thanks very much, Rob, and good evening, everybody. Um, so bear with me while, while I find my presentation. There we go. OK, so as I'm kicking off uh, this evening, I thought I'd present some quite um, high level thoughts on this idea of uh, regenerative agriculture. It's become quite a trendy buzzword over the past couple of years and give my personal perspective on it as a way of introducing the ASSIST project and as a background more generally to the work we do at Rothamsted on um, agroecology and nature-based solutions. So to start off a, a bit of history, um, hopefully most people are uh, familiar with uh, Rothamsted and the history of Rothamsted, but if you're not, um, we've been around since 1843 and Rothamsted was founded by the gentleman on the left here, Sir John Bennett Laws, who was a Victorian scientist. So he was, um, uh, he knew of Charles Darwin and he was a contemporary of Charles Darwin. And the gentleman on his right is uh, his colleague, Joseph Henry Gilbert. And between them, uh, they started Rothamsted as an agricultural research station. And most importantly, they set up a series of 
experiments on the impact of fertilizers on crop yields that are still continuing to this day. Um, Rothamsted Manor is where uh, Sir John Bennett Laws uh, lived back in the 1800s. And I'm going to use one of those long term experiments that you may have heard of, the Broadbalk experiment, as a way of summarizing how we got to where we are now in terms of modern crop production systems, and perhaps to illustrate why we may need to um, change our approach somewhat. So this is the Broadbalk experiment. Um, if you have an opportunity to visit Rothamsted, uh, you can come and see uh, the experiment. It started in 1843 to compare the effect of different fertilizers to farmyard manure. So the long plots that you can see on the left there with different shades of green, they're the different fertilizer treatments, which originally ran the whole length of the field. Uh, but since uh, 1926, they've been split into sections. That was primarily to control weeds so that parts of the field could be uh, fallowed every five years. And now we use those sections to look at other treatments like rotation and um, the effect of pesticides. Although most of the experiment is still in continuous winter wheat. An important point about the experiment is it's not a museum, so we don't crop winter wheat as we would have done in the 1800s, but we incorporate new innovations in crop husbandry and agronomy into the experiment as they are introduced more generally in the industry. So the experiment becomes a really nice uh, way of monitoring and charting the impact of changes in crop husbandry and the changes in crop production. And that's what we can see on uh, this figure here. This is our classic yield graph from the Broadbalk experiment. I'm um, sorry, it looks a bit complicated. This is probably the most complicated graph that you'll see this evening. But on the vertical axis there, you can see grain yields and uh, we're around the UK average, around eight or nine tonnes per hectare. The uh, blue line along the bottom there, which is the time series since the start of the experiment, is where we don't add any fertilisers. So where you don't add fertilisers, we're still getting about one tonne per hectare. The pink and the purple lines are where we add optimum inorganic fertilisers or farmyard manure plus a bit of extra inorganic N. And the dotted lines at the top there, the orange and the green lines, are uh, wheat following a break crop. Uh, the other lines are continuous winter wheat. And I just want to draw your uh, attention to uh, two time periods um, to set up our discussion around the need for regenerative ag. And the first one is the, the very dramatic impact of the Green Revolution between the 1960s and the 1990s, about a tripling of yields. That was primarily driven by improvements in crop breeding. So the names that you see along the bottom there, you might recognize some of those. Those are the, the wheat, winter wheat cultivars that have been grown on the experiment. And Capel de Prez there is the first dwarfed or short strawed variety with a dramatically higher harvest index and yield. But the thing to notice um, from this is that you only see that increase in yield potential when it's combined with uh, inputs, when it's combined with inorganic fertilizer inputs, and also importantly, crop protection products. So uh, modern pesticides came along about the same time as the modern crop varieties in the 1960s. And they have enabled the increased yield potential of modern cultivars to be realized. And then the next uh, striking thing, and this is already mentioned by uh, Rob, is the, the yield plateau that we've observed since about the early 2000s, where we're not seeing the incremental increases in yield that crop breeders are still observing, but we're not observing them at the farm gate. And so there might be uh, an issue with the current uh, cropping system that we're pursuing. So this uh, illustrates how we've become locked into simplified systems with high inputs, because that's what the uh, modern crop varieties have been bred for. Um, so, is there a need for change? Does that yield plateau um, suggest that we might need alternative approaches or a different way of doing things? Um, I've just got three um, suggested reasons why there might be a need for change, this need for regenerative approaches. Uh, the first is that uh, there will inevitably be a limit to how much we can improve uh, the yield of crop cultivars. So here you see on the left uh, an old cultivar at the top, which is well over a metre high, 
and a, mo a modern cultivar down the bottom there, probably 60 or 70 centimetres. Um, so most of the uh, gains in yield have been won through changing the architecture of the crop and changing uh, the harvest index. There's a limit um, to how much we can continue to breed uh, for increased yield potential. Secondly, I would suggest we're losing the crop protection battle. This is a nice uh, graphic from a recent paper from the Weed Group at Rothamsted, which quantified the impact of herbicide resistant blackgrass on, um, on farm businesses. So the figures you see there are the average cost of resistance in terms of um, crop protection and also lost yield. And then the little um, section of the pie in red is the proportion or the calculated proportion of the overall gross profit that that represents. And you can see that that varies by region because we know that blackgrass uh, prefers uh, the heavier clays in the southeast. And so it has more of an impact. But I think it's fair to say that we're losing the crop protection battle in terms of uh, pests, weeds and diseases are evolving resistance to chemical pesticides more quickly. And the introduction of new pesticides or active ingredients is slowing down. And then finally, we're all well aware of the increased input prices. If we're locked into these uh, high input systems where um, we're very vulnerable to um, increases in, for example, fertilizer prices. Uh, Rob's also already mentioned this, the unintended consequences. So they're kind of the agronomic threats to the sustainability of uh, current cropping systems. There are unintended consequences uh, like the reduction in, in biodiversity, the well-documented decline in farmland bird numbers, for example. Um, and I like this graph because on the top there, you've got the uh, UK winter wheat yields taken from the FAO uh, stat website, illustrating again the increase in the, over the Green Revolution and then the plateauing of yields. And it's almost directly mirrored by uh, the farmland bird index uh, graph on the bottom there. And as a plug for a new book uh, that I was involved in on the right that documents um, a lot of these declines in a range of taxa, including plants and invertebrates, as well as birds. Um, OK, so still thinking about the need for change, the need for regenerative approaches. Um, so I think this is the, the final one in this little set. And this uh, speaks to the issue of declining soil health. These uh, graphs need a bit of explanation, but all you need to understand is that the amount of soil carbon that you can store in your soil is related to the soil texture. So if you've got more clay in your soil, you can uh, hold more, uh, capture more carbon. And so the ratio between clay and carbon is an indication of how well your soil is doing in terms of its carbon content. And we know soil carbon is important for lots of soil functions uh, like water holding capacity, uh, porosity and uh, nutrient cycling. Um, so by using this uh, ratio, we can have an indication of the status of soils in terms of in terms of how much of their potential for soil carbon are they currently meeting. And all, all you need to understand is um, if uh, you're in the, the orange zone or if that ratio is in the orange zone, then your soils are very good. If they're in the purple zone, their soils are uh, degraded. And on the right there, you can see the proportion of samples from a national database of soils taken from different land uses, which are in that good or that poor category. And I'll just draw your attention to the, to the top line there for arable land use. You see that 38% of the samples were in the poor category, indicating that they had a lot less carbon than they really should have in them. And you can contrast that with uh, lays and permanent grass, where uh, much more of the samples were in the good category. OK, so I hope I've convinced you that there are some issues with our modern intensive uh, industrialised farming systems that need to be addressed, not just for the externalities, but also for the threats they are to the sustainable production of uh, crops in those systems. And that's what's behind uh, a number of calls for alternative approaches to agriculture or more sustainable approaches to cropping systems. 
This term regenerative agriculture seems to be particularly in vogue at the moment. It's very difficult to define. Various people have tried to define it, and I've, I've picked one out of the literature here. Um, but we can, in, we can think of it as a, a collection of ingredients. And in arable systems, that might include increased green cover, reduced tillage, addition of organic matter, integration of livestock, greater crop diversity and habitat creation in livestock systems, perhaps uh, more pasture fed uh, livestock and the integration of herbal lays or different grazing systems. Um, a lot of these will be familiar um, to you. Um, and interestingly, they've been called different things over the years. And I think rather confusingly, we've got regenerative agriculture at the moment, um, but there's all these other terms that have been used in the past, integrated pest management, ecological intensification, sustainable intensification. Um, and this graph here is uh, something that a, um, a member of my team did, just looking at how different terms come into uh, fashion and then fall out of fashion at the moment. It's all about regen ag. I tend to think of these things as, they're all the same collection of ingredients, um, you know, increased green cover, increased diversification, creation of habitats, but in different recipes. Um, and that's how I, I tend to think of them. But we're we're all talking about more or less the same a collection of interventions. Um, and that brings me on to the assist project. I don't have a lot of slides on this because uh, Sam is going to talk in more detail about what we actually did on Hope Farm. But I'll give you some background to it and, and the background to the ASSIST project. It was a five year project with ourselves, UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology in the British Geological Survey. And the big philosophy was, can we um, test those different ingredients of regenerative agriculture? Can we actually provide an evidence base for the contribution of those nature based solutions or that uh, ecology to the production system? So there were two big. Uh, questions that the, the project was oriented around. Can we quantify the potential contribution of biodiversity and natural capital on the farm to the production systems? Our, our objective and our focus was always on crop production, okay? always on food security and the contribution of the ecology to that food security. And then can we find ways of mitigating the impact of crop husbandry and crop production on those ecosystem services and natural capital. So can we better balance the system? Can we better integrate those ecological functions into our, um, into our cropping systems? So again, um, you, can, you can visit the website to find the detail on it, but this just gives you an idea of the breadth of the science that we did. So we had a theme that was looking at the importance of soil health, landscape diversity, ecosystem services to maintaining the resilience of food production. We had a theme that was looking at specifically water quality and biodiversity and how we can better balance crop production with biodiversity. The third theme is Sam's going to talk about that in detail in a, in a moment about how we can test these nature based solutions. And then theme four was uh, designing systems at scale. And then finally, um, primarily through the team at CEH, there are a range of tools that have been produced by the projects. You might be familiar with the tool eSurveyor, uh, which is the middle picture there, which is designed to help land managers target and implement these nature-based solutions uh, on their particular farm. And with that, I'm going to stop because I'm conscious of time and I want to make sure uh, that I can hand over to Sam in good time. So I've finished my bit, Rob. Thank you. OK, thanks very much, uh, Jonathan. That's uh, a really good, interesting start. Um, and now I'd like to uh, get into a bit more detail, um, as John alluded to, uh, and introduce Dr Sam Cook. Uh, Sam's a behavioural ecologist working at Rothamsted on ecological based tactics for IPM, integrated pest management, with re recent work, including that on the ASSIST programme. Uh, and Sam's going to talk now about the ASSIST farm network, testing sustainable intensification within real arable systems. Okay, thanks very much, Rob. And can you see my screen? <laughs> 
Can somebody tell me if you can yes. see? Yes, yes, right. we can right. see it. Thanks. Okay, well, thanks very much. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk about the Assist Farm Network, which was the theme three and testing sustainable intensification within um, real arable systems. Okay, so um, unfortunately, we seem to have a dichotomy of farming systems that have a conflict between food production on one axis and um, nature based or production, um, nature based capital on the other. With high input farming, as we've heard, um, feeding the world, but causing some problems environmentally on one hand, and organic agriculture um, really looking after the environment, but um, not really producing so much food in comparison. So we need to really start to think about how we can use the middle ground and create win-win situations with high food production um, with high natural capital um, in, in addition. So we might do this by maintaining yields of conventional systems whilst in reducing the environmental impact or in organic systems, increasing yields without um, um, in further increasing um, negative environmental impacts. So ASSIST was trying to really quantify how these different methods can achieve this win-win situation. And the aim of ASSIST um, Work Package 3 was trying to quantify at a systems level the benefits of sustainable management practices that enhance these ecosystem service pr processes that are vital for supporting crop production. And these are pollination, pest regulation and soil health. So at the beginning of the project, we discussed the practical interventions that we might test in our project, and we co-designed them with farmers. And some of these farmers that are sitting in this room actually became the ASSIST um, network, um, and we're really grateful for all of their help. They pointed out um, three main um, methods in which we could um, test in our experiments, and that was to sown field margins to support biodiversity that are beneficial insects that help crop production, including pollinators and natural enemies of crop pests that basically eat the pest and provide pest control for free. Um, growing cover crops, which on one hand increases biodiversity, but on the other hand helps to um, improve soil structure and or adding organic matter, which again helps um, soil structure and enhances the soil functions. So getting beneficials into the crop. So field margins are well known to support biodiversity. If you plant a field margin, you get loads more insects than if that field margin wasn't there. But previous evidence has suggested that um, there is a decline of these insects as you move into the crop fields. So as you can see for the ladybirds on the left, um, 50 meters into the crop, you see half the number um, of ladybirds that you do um, 10 meters from the field margin. Similarly with bees, you um, get a decreasing number of bees as you move from the field edge to the field interior. So we decided to um, have infield strips, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, and to really design very carefully or as carefully as possible, um, a, a very diverse mix um, in, our, in our experiments. The flowering species were chosen to benefit what we thought would attract specific groups of bees for pollination. Parasitic wasps, which lay their eggs inside um, aphids and pest prey and kill them and other predators that come in like hoverflies and ladybirds that eat the, the, the pest insects. And we also included tussocky grasses to benefit the predatory ground beetles and spiders that take the prey as they drop to the ground or climb up the, um, the, the, the um, crop foliage and take the pests from the, from the crop plants. So these infield strips were intended to try to help to bring in, you know, reduce this edge effect that we're seeing um, with field margins and really bring in the ecosystem services right to the field center where it's most needed. So we were hoping to really, um, you know, have um, the, the natural enemies right in the middle of the crop where it's most needed and not you know, have this absence of pests in the middle, natural enemies in the middle. 
we had a network of 18 commercial farms, mainly based in the southeast of England. Seven sites were monitored by Rothenstead and eight were monitored by CEH. And CEH had another three sites that came into the project slightly later. And the project was run over four years. So four years of sampling from 2018 to 2021. The experimental design was the same on all of these field sites on each farm. There was three fields which were randomly assigned to one of three treatments. So treatment one was the control, which was business as usual, no, no additions at all. Treatment two was supposed to support the ecosystem service processes by the addition of cover crops and these um, field margins at either end of the, um, the field. And then treatment three was trying to maximize these ecosystem service delivery, bring it right into the middle of the field by not only having cover crops and the wildlife margins at both ends, but have these infield strips in the middle of the field, plus the addition of green waste or farmyard manure for soil health. So to try to standardize um, sampling between the fields and the field sites, because all the field sizes were different, we decided to sample field corners. And these were very, very carefully selected with each treatment, trying to balance the orientation of boundary features. So you'll see in this uh, example here, in each of our three fields, we've actually got um, a corner of hedgerows um, in the same orientation because these could have effects on our, on our treatments um, and, and influence our results. In terms of sampling, this was done on a very carefully thought out spatial grid um, with the distance between, which is based on the distance of the infield strips. So the infield strips were placed every 96 meters throughout the field um, to fit in with the, with the tractors and the boom lengths. And we sampled along the transects at sample points that were 12, 24, 48 and 96 metres from the crop edge. So this meant that we had 16 total sampling points in the middle of the field, four in the field boundaries and four in the field margins um, in the middle of the field. So that's quite a lot of sampling. <laughs> So we wanted to quantify the background levels of biodiversity, what's there in terms of insects in total, include the key service providing taxa, so bees, butterflies, um, natural enemies, um, with a focus on service delivery, not just proxies. A lot of this work has said, right, I put a field margin in, I've got loads more hoverflies, therefore it's better. Well, what we wanted to know is, well, how many uh, insects were those hoverflies eating? And we wanted to link those service delivery impacts to yield that we found in the crops. So we had a lot of sampling going on all throughout these four years. Every year, we looked at the plants in the field margins. We looked at plant cover, percent sown species that were supposed to be there, and the weeds that came up that weren't supposed to be there, but still providing some good stuff. We did that once a year. We looked at the um, plant insect interactions that were going on in the margin by visual assessments. So we had um, uh, expert taxonomists looking at the flowers and seeing if there were any insect interactions occurring on those flowers. Pest gastropods, so slugs and snails were counted and measured. We attracted them under sources with, with mash. And then we counted them, we put them in a bag and weighed them and looked at them to species after 24 hours. Looked at the weeds in the crop, particularly black grass, um, looking at the percentage cover of those weeds um, throughout the field. Looking for the biodiversity. So this is all about everything that's there, pests, natural enemies, pollinators. We looked at that by basically sucking it up with a hoover-like instrument called a vortis suction sample. Um, this sucks the insects through and collects it in a bag, which we tied up, took back to the lab, and then separated out all the insects, counted them, and identified them to species. And we recorded thousands and thousands and thousands of these species. The ground predators were um, sampled using pitfall trapping, so little cups were dug into the soil, filled with a uh, killing fluid, 
um, the beetles run across the soil, fall into the pitfall trap. We collected them a week later. And again, on the right, you can see all of the different insects that were collected um, and identified from the pitfall traps. We did crop searches, so we got down on our hands and knees and we looked at five um, different plants at each of those sample points, very carefully looking at the plants, recording the number of pests and the beneficial insects that we saw. So here you can see we found some aphids on this plant and this wheat plant. Um, some of those aphids were parasitized, which you can see in the middle, the aphid mummies. And sometimes those mummies, like Cetopia navini mummies, were right on the awns of, of some of the plants. So really, really looking carefully to see what was there. Here you can see we found um, cereal leaf beetle pest. That's a pest at the top left. Um, but then we've got lots of beneficial insects that we found also evidence of hoverfly larvae, um, spiders, ladybirds, and um, lacewing eggs. Um, to measure predation, we used sentinel prey. So it's very difficult to actually record or measure predation. So we put out artificial caterpillars. So these were two different sizes to kind of mimic a, a big fat slug and a tiny little um, maybe uh, pupa as it's dropping to the ground to predate in the soil. Um, and we put these out and then three days later we looked at the bite marks that were, were left on these by predators that tried to, to eat them. Um, as you can see the top there, uh, that was taken by a bird. Um, the middle one is the bite marks <clears throat> of a small mammal. And the one at the bottom is the mandible um, marks left by a carabid beetle. Um, also looked at sentinel aphids. So we put five very carefully reared aphids with no viruses <laughs> released on a, on a leaf. Um, we visited it three days later to see how many aphids were still there. Um, similarly, sentinel aphids, we glued them to cards and we put those on the ground or on the and on the plant foliage five um, aphids in a row and after 24 hours came back to see how many had been eaten. We took soil samples to me measure the soil health properties and we looked at earthworms. Um, this survey was adapted from the 30-minute worm survey which is quite well known now developed by Jackie Stroud at Rothamsted. Dig a hole, you count the worms, and we identified them into the different types that you see. So juveniles, the litter dwellers, the topsoil dwellers, and the deep burrowers. And we put them back very carefully afterwards. <laughs> In the yield, we hand harvested a metre area um, at each of the sample points, um, which was very hard work. <laughs> and we also compared this to the yield maps from GPS enabled combines and um, where those were available on the farms. So what did we find? This is a bit of a caveat. These are preliminary results. We have got loads and loads and loads of data over the four years. Um, it differs spatially, temporally, with the different farms, the different treatments. So we're still crunching the data, but we do have some preliminary results to share. So the field and the infield margin strip establishment results, as you would expect, um, the sown species did come up differently <laughs> in each site, and mainly according to the weather conditions at the time and the soil conditions and soil types. With the sown grasses, we got really good establishment of wheat of um, grasses such as um, crested dog's tails and red fescues, but less establishment of the other um, grasses like tall, tall fescues. Of the flowering plants, again, um, quite a number of them established well. Yarrow, common knapweed, as you can see in this um, photo here, oxide daisies just did well everywhere. Um, some of the clovers did really well. Um, unfortunately, other plants, particularly field scabious and um, fleabane tufted vetch, didn't really do well in, in any of the sites. So what are these plants actually delivering for farmers in the fields or for biodiversity in the fields? So this is a kind of a graph of the, the, the plants that we found in the margins and the breadth of the graph of the bars represent how many, the abundance of those different plant species. And the top bar shows the number of insects that we found um, 
feeding on those plants or resting on those plants um, during our surveys. And so we can link these two and actually start to define what, um, what plant species are being used by which insects. And we can put together these quite complex food webs um, and the links uh, represent the number of, of interactions we saw, say with the hoverflies, very broad bar leading to the oxide daisies, for example, and the um, wild carrots. So the hoverflies really liked those. Parasitoids similarly really liked um, oxide daisies. Bumblebees, the bumble Bumbus lapidarius really likes kind of um, the um, knapweeds. Um, so we can start to understand which plants are most useful for attracting the insects that we want to attract into the field that are going to perform ecosystem services for us. Um, here And here's an example of that in terms of the parasitoids and the predators. So again, hoverflies really liked these um, umbellifers, basically, and wide open flowers um, that are easy to access. In terms of predation, um, we found significantly more aphids that were predated on the, on the aphid cards when they were placed on the soil surface than the plants. So the plants is on the left and the cards are on the right. So you can see that there's more aphids taken um, when the plants, when the cards were on the ground, which you kind of maybe expected really. There's more, um, basically that means that the ground predators are more important for controlling the pests when they're running around the ground. Fewer of them climb the plant surface. And um, there were significant differences between the treatments, which was really great to see. Um, in this case, there were significantly more aphids taken on the um, treatment three. So that's when we've got the infield strips, that's the blue bars, the blue lines. Um, than the um, treatment two with just the field margins either side um, and significantly more than the control. So adding these different um, ecosystem structures really does help. And remember we looked at this um, on a spatial scale and we found no effect of distance from the margin um, in this case. In terms of worms, um, we again we found significant treatment differences. Generally, there were more worms again um, in treatment three um, with the soil amendments, which might be expected um, compared to treatment two, and very much um, more than compared to the control. So these um, really does seem to be making a, a difference. Strangely, we found differences between worm type with distance, which were a bit contrary. So we found the juveniles and the top soil worms increased with distance from the crop edge, but the litter dwellers and the deep burrowing worms decreased with distance. So we're going to have to have a bit of, of think about that and <laughs> what that actually means. But um, certainly we're finding differences, which is which is good. Um, in terms of impacts in yields, so uh, we looked at yields across all four sites and all four years in this graph um, and concentrated on the cereals and obviously grape crops. Um, in year one, that's the business as usual bar. So in the next um, graph bars, we are comparing um, treatment two, which is blue, to the control and the orange bar is comparing infield strips to the control. And you can see that as the years progress, basically the, the, the yield differential gets higher. So um, the sustainable management systems are having positive effects on yield. And it seems that the complex system treatment three is on average the best. And, but it seems that it is taking time for these biological systems to respond. So in summary, we can say that there is more to sustainability than yield. Um, sustainable intensification shows promise, real promise to support yields under real world conditions. Um, and these flexible and simple options really do work. Um, in our analysis and in the future, we've really got to think about how infrastructure cost and um, the run-in time before results occur um, affects the, uh, the results and what they mean. 
and we have to think about the socioeconomic barriers to uptake and engagement. Our, our farmers were actually very willing to put field margins right in the middle of the field. I was actually really surprised about that. Um, but how how widespread is that going to be? Is is average Joe Blog farmer really going to do that? Um, and we really have to start to think about trying to future proof um, the farming system um, to enable um, high production and the conservation of our biodiversity in farmland. Thank you very much for listening. Um, thanks to our funders and ma massive thanks if any of you are listening um, to our uh, assist work package three farmers and um, to our amazing field team as well that, that helped to gather in all these data. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sam. That's really nice to see some results coming through from that. Um, I can't wait to read it, it in its entirety, but I think you've probably still got your work cut out. Um, now, just moving on, uh, we're getting down right down to the single farm scale now. I'd like to introduce uh, Georgie Bray, who uh, works for us here at RSPB. She's the Hope Farm Manager. Uh, who is uh, overseeing the farmland management communications and advisory work, linking uh, the farm's research to uh, our advocacy and policy work. Um, and George is going to talk about planning habitats, placement and management for, for nature and IPM at home farm from the farmer's perspective. Thank you. Take it away, Georgie. Thanks very much for that, Rob. Um, so if I just share my screen now. There we go. Can you see that all right, Rob? Yep, that's fine. Good, I'll assume that everyone else can as well then. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about how we're trying to boost ecosystem services at Hope Farm, um, focusing on a bit on habitats and then some other things that we've got going on as well. Um, I won't talk too much about the background behind what we are and what we do at Hope Farm. Um, can, there's plenty of other places we've got online that talk about that, but we're 180 hectares and we're based in the south of um, Cambridgeshire and um, we work with a contractor and yeah there's quite a small team of us on the farm trying to do what we've got in the heading here so I'll talk a little bit about the practical side of things um, and I'll start off with this which is um, so a big part of what we try and do at Hope Farm is to demonstrate that looking after nature can work within a profitable system and that looking after nature element really um, helps to underpin our integrated pest management work um, and all works to a plan. Um, this is the broad plan that we try and work to. And um, we have more than 2% of seed rich and flower rich habitats um, because they can fit in so many places on the farm where they do actually help us do the farming. Um, but this is a really good way of looking at a farm and using it to try and think about how, yeah, how your farm can work into it. And it's great to just keep this in the back of our mind to make sure that we are delivering on all aspects to help help nature recover on the farm. Um, this isn't just a plan put together by RSPB at all. There's um, 11 conservation organisations that feed into this plan um, that's formed the Farm Wildlife Partnership. And there's a website you can get a whole load of information on managing these key habitats. Um, but we, I'll just run through them all quickly. So we've got the existing habitats at the top left, um, which are a um, hotspot for wildlife on the farm. So if you can start to connect those up, that's a really good place to start. And um, there's a wildflower meadow in the corner there. And they're looking at field boundaries, which are a great way of connecting up those existing habitats. 2% um, seed rich habitat, um, less so perhaps 
well, less so perhaps from an invertebrate perspective, but that is solely for farmland birds who rely so much on seed rich habitat, which is why that's in there. Um, minimum of 2% flower rich habitat. And we've got quite a bit more of that on farm um, for reasons like what Sam explained earlier that having flower rich habitats can provide such a good resource for beneficial insects that we want to try and connect the farm um, as much as we can with that with that kind of resource. Um, wet features are great, not just for aquatic life, but loads of other things as well rely on water to thrive. So we've got a few ponds on the farm. That's a bit of management we did there um, quite a few years ago now to make more of those. And tomorrow we're out digging some old um, dried out ponds so that they can provide for years to come a, a good source of water for things in the summer, um, which I think this year, a lot of, a lot of stuff on the farm has really probably quite relieved that we still had a pond that was holding water in those really high temperatures. Um, it's a real, yeah, a life jacket for a lot, um, a lot of species. And then the final one is in fields, which again, I'll, I'll talk about that a bit more at the end. And it's, we've got a picture here of these assist margins going through the middle of our field, connecting those habitats. Um, but it's about that whole farm's approach. So looking after good soil health, as well as thinking about increasing the accessibility for invertebrates for birds and things like skylark plots um by yeah by thinking about that whole farm system approach um so that's the broad plan that we work to um and this is what it's delivered on the farm so we've had monitoring going right from um over 20 years ago now and our farmland uh, butterfly index our butterflies are still on an upward trajectory so that's really helped to deliver by providing those habitats um we've got the red line there is what's happening at hope farm and the blue line is what's happening in the rest of england um, with the farm and butterflies and the dashed line by the way that's the baseline that we set so these are uh, percentage change of um the species we're looking at so this is the farmland bird breeding index um, red line is what's happening at Hope Farm and there's still that steady decline in the UK unfortunately in the blue um, but we sit at about 220% above baseline when we started and then the winter farmland bird index is really interesting we haven't got a UK comparison but um, that's increased by about a thousand percent on average but that really changes depending on what's going on the farm um, but yeah that's just I hope to show you that it really does deliver for nature having that kind of plan. Um, now I'm going to go into a bit more detail about some of the habitats that we're making um, and how we set about trying to make sure that, sorry, I've got a cat here who's trying to um, interrupt the presentation, um, on how we plan what's going where, um, and give us the best chances of establishing something that is going to make the best use of uh, public money that we're paid to deliver these habitats so that it is really delivering for nature. Um, and that's taking time to plan what goes where so that it makes sense of the farm business and, and for nature. Um, really thinking about what to plant, taking time to establish and having lots of patience and persistence as well, I think is a, is a common thing that we keep coming up against. Um, so when we're planning the area of a farm, um, we try and think what fits best with the farm system as a start and a must. Um, and if we're going out walking on another farm as well, trying to figure or help the farmer see what works where, we need to know what's going on in that farm as well. Um, what crops are going, looking at what yields are in different areas of the farm. Um, if there's some really light soil somewhere that is less likely to deliver a high yielding wheat crop, that light land could actually be really good for wildflowers because they like nutrient impoverished soil. So it's a win-win. Um, if there are awkward corners, they can go for winter bird seed mixes and all of those kinds of things. Um, it's about connecting the habitats across the farm as well. So thinking about making sure we've got that those six key actions um, in a way that makes it accessible to nature across the farm. Um, if you've got 300 acres, you don't want to put right up at one side your feeding resources for birds to 
get insects to feed the chicks and then have your hedge that's a really good destining habitat the other side of the farm because that means that those adults are going to have to travel a long way to get food and bring it back to their chicks um and in the same way sam's um and the assist research has really demonstrated the importance of connectivity for delivering for the farm system as well um so making sure that if you've got huge fields like we have um, our biggest field is 30 hectares we want to connect that up so that it isn't just a monoculture in the middle um and yeah planning different habitats to deliver across the species life cycle as well so thinking about food shelter um seed rich habitats um but not not to labour the point, but yeah, that farm wildlife plan is does quite a good job of it's a no regrets way of delivering for nature on the whole. So um, 